I'm going to be talking about how labels limit children. And it's the labels that we give children that get in the way. And we often think, well, if they're good, if they're positive labels, then they must help. But I'd like to show tonight that actually labels get in the way, whether they're positive or negative. Some while ago, I did a wine tasting course. I was trying to keep up with uh, my good friend Dick Brown here. He knows a lot about wine. I went away and I did a sommelier course to learn how to taste wine, to smell wine. And we had to do an exam at the end of it. And I got 76% in the final exam. I was absolutely thrilled. I thought, that is fantastic, because I knew nothing about wine beforehand. And all of a sudden, after this 20-day course, there I was, 76%. And I was really, really pleased. Until the git of a teacher sent us all the results, the whole list. And guess where I had come? <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, I had come bottom. My friends and family said, have you got the uh, results yet? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, they must have, must have got lost in the post. I had made huge progress, and yet I was disappointed. I was disappointed because I was at the bottom of the list. And how many of our children feel that way? They made enormous progress in whatever subject, children who move to this country, they speak no Swedish, and within a year they're speaking phenomenal amount of Swedish, but it's not as much as the children who were born here. And how do they feel? And the moment we've got ranks, the moment we've got a list of scores, then children start to believe that there's some clever children, there's some average children, and there's some right down at the bottom. My first teaching job, this boy called Stuart walked up to me. I still remember his name because on the day I left that school, he gave me a signed photograph of himself. <laughs> Thanks very much, Stuart. I'll treasure it forever. But on the first day at that school, he walked up to me. He stuck out his arm. He says, hello, sir. My name's Stuart. I'm one of the special needs boys, and I sit in the cupboard over there. <laughs> I thought, the boy's got to be joking but there were 38 children in the class and the room wasn't big enough to fit them all in. So they'd open one of the big walk-in cupboards and they'd put a round table in the cupboard and five children sat in that cupboard. All of them were struggling with numeracy or literacy or some other subject. How do you think that made them feel? I was working in Australia last year and I did some lessons with some of the students. As these 16-year-old students walked in, one of the teachers leaned across to me and said, these are not the bright ones. I sat down with the students. I said, what are you studying? They said, VCAL. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. They said, it stands for the Victoria Certificate of Applied Learning. I said, I still don't know what that means. And they said, it means we're stupid. I said, what do you mean? They said, the clever children, they go and do... VCE, but if you're stupid like us, you have to learn how to use your hands and do VCAL. 16 years old, and they're telling me that they're stupid. Why is that? Why are they able to come to school to learn that they're stupid? Let me show you a photograph. This is my daughter with two of her friends. My daughter is known as a social butterfly. She's a really friendly child. And at her school, if anybody is new at the school, my daughter is asked to look after them. One of the other children in that photograph, she is very sporty, really sporty. She loves athletics, she loves swimming, she loves to run around, she just likes to do everything at top speed. And the boy there is known as being very, very good at English. His language is superb. That sounds good. It sounds nice for teachers to say, you're a beautiful social butterfly. You're brilliant at maths. You're bri brilliant at English. You're brilliant at sport. It sounds lovely. But let me show you this from Jacqueline Eccles. She says, the amount of application 
that somebody puts in, the amount of effort I put into something, or anybody puts into something, is equivalent to how much they value doing it, multiplied by, and it's really important this, multiplied by expectation. You see, if their expectation is zero, then what is anything multiplied by zero? Value could be 10 out of 10. But if expectation is zero, then how much application do they put in? Zero. If my daughter is asked to work with a group, to get on, to do some good group work, my daughter will think that's a good thing to do, and she will expect to do very well, because she's been told she's a social butterfly. However, if she's told, we want you to do some brilliant English, some brilliant writing, some brilliant reading, she values that. She likes re reading. She likes writing. But the problem is, if she then looks at the boy, the boy in this picture, and she thinks to herself, yes, but he's better. He's better than me. I can write. I can do some good writing. But I can't be as good as him. Then her expectation becomes very low, particularly if she thinks she's been asked to be the best. And we hear it again and again and again in school, do your best. We all do our best. And a lot of children see that as, I have to be the best. Rather than do my best, I have to be the best. And expectation drops. The other two children, if they're asked to do good group work, let's see which is the best group to work together, their expectation drops. Why? because the social butterfly is not in their group. They might value working together, and they can say that they, they think it's a good thing, but their expectation is low because they're all the time thinking, I have to be the best, and there's other people who are better than me. So how does that work? Now, of course, some teachers say, well, yeah, but that's just the way are. they are. They're individuals. We can't all be the same. We can't all be the best at everything. But you might be interested to know a little bit of a story about these three. My daughter has been to six different schools. That's not because we keep moving schools, but it's because I travel a lot. And when she was younger, before she even started school, she went on these trips with me. And rather than sit in the hotel or walk around the city, she went to visit other schools. The first school she went to was in Australia. And there she was, in with the kindergarten kids, and I went to see how she was getting on. She was only four years old. She sat on a chair, and she was telling them all about England, and all about Annick Castle, where they filmed Harry Potter, and we live next door to Annick Castle, and they, she was telling them all about this. Do you think that had an impact on her sociability, that she goes to all these different contexts? The, the boy who is excellent at English, if you visit his home, and uh, I know his parents well, you visit his home, everything is labelled. Door, handle, kettle, tea, spoon. Because his mother has written all these labels and stuck them on. If you go to their house and you spend long enough there, you'll get labelled. Forehead, backside, arm, you'll get labelled. <laughs> their children write these labels for everything. That's what their parents see as an important thing to do. Do you think that has an impact? on his reading and writing. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be doing these things. But think about what impact that has. Then they get to school, and there's this boy, already got lots of advantages with language, and then the teacher says, and you're brilliant at language. So you can continue with the language. How many times as teachers do we say, I know you're struggling with your maths, but you're great at English. Or I know you're struggling with your science, but I saw you outside on the football field and you were brilliant. And what is that saying to the children? I'm good at one thing, but I can't be, or I probably won't be, as good at something else. How many times do children at home say, Dad, will you help me with my spelling? Will you help me with my maths? And Dad says, I was never any good at spelling. Go and ask your mother. So the child is walking away thinking, aha, there's a genetic reason why I can't spell. It's because I've got a stupid dad. What happens to their expectation then? 
when we ask them to learn to spell, to learn their maths, to put in their effort? What's happening to their expectation? You see, this list of scores actually tells us nothing. All it says is who's at the top, who's in the middle, who's at the bottom. It tells us nothing about learning. What do we need to know? We need to know what happens next. As teachers, as parents, as students, we need to know what happens next so that we can then look at the progress the children are making. Now if you look at that, you can see those children in the middle are making more progress than either the top or the bottom. And isn't that what school's about? Coming to school to make progress. And if we can switch children's focus away from being the best to making progress, if we can focus on that, it changes how much they apply themselves, how much effort they put in. In the UK, we give children spellings tests. This is one taken from a school close to me. More often than not, children get 10 out of 10 because they're given it to learn. This is, this is for six-year-old children. They get 10 out of 10. Should we applaud them then? Should we say, well done, you got 10 out of 10? The question, it seems to me, is, well, what did they start with? If they knew 9 out of 10 before we even asked them to learn, then how many have we actually asked them to learn? Just the one. We need, I think, we need a pre-test. We need to say, right, here's your words for next week. Take a look at them because in two minutes' time, I'm giving you a pre-test. I'm going to find out how many you know now. So let's say, for example, one child gets four. Now we know where we're starting from. Then, the following week, we can give the test. And let's say, now they get ten out of ten. We can take the first score away from the second score, and now we've got a progress score. Yes, the children are going to compare with each other, but at least it's comparing progress. And it seems to me that progress is so much closer to learning than who's got the top score. Because we don't know where they started from. That's a spellings test. Every single week they're given this. A few months ago, this was the list that they were given. Now, I don't know if you get those words, but in England I'm looking at those thinking, what on earth was on the teachers' minds there? When we got those, all the dads looked at them and think, wow, this is great. This must be the agenda for the weekend. <laughs> all the wives were running for their lives. Get a, a dictionary of English slang and you'll see what I mean. Here's another thing, I think. Rather than reporting, you got 6 out of 10, you got 8 out of 10, you got 9 out of 10, let's report back in terms of progress. Let's give them these charts and say, here's the progress you've made. Now, notice the... A uh, scale on the side. That's for one child, but we could have a different scale for a different child. So one scale could start at zero, but another scale could start at 30. Because the key that the children will be focusing on is the progress. I need to make progress. It doesn't matter whether I got 40 and she got 60, or whether I got 40 and he only got 20. What matters is, am I doing better than I was before? Am I making progress? And I think the key to getting children to focus on that is to have these sorts of things, to have progress charts. One thing that really helps is previewing, saying tomorrow we're going to be doing this, or next week we're going to be doing that. For example, I saw this in a school recently that I've been working with. It simply tells the parents, it tells the children what's going on tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about shape. And it gives the parents time to talk about it as they're walking home with their children, to talk about shapes, to talk about these different shapes, the different parts of the shapes. Compare one shape with another, and it gives the children chance to be making progress before they even come to school. Lots of ways to do it. We can have preview clubs at school. So in your after-school groups. We could have that for those children who don't get much support at home. We could send, set home preparation rather than homework. 
set home preparation. We give pre-course reading for the older students. So next week we're going to be, here's some pre-course reading. Tomorrow we're going to be studying that. Have a look at this. And it gives the children time to switch on. For those children who need that extra support, I started life as a teaching assistant. I had to support children. And we were always playing catch-up. I always had to support a few children to play catch-up. It seems to me the deficit model. What we ought to be doing is getting those children who need extra support and do the work with them before the class do it, before everybody else does it, so that they've got a heads up, so that they feel ready to have a go. That they are saying, OK, I know about this. I've, I know about a triangle. I know about a circle. I know the difference between a circle and a triangle. They feel more ready to take part. And it's focusing on progress. Here's a lovely example um, from Australia. I came from, this is a year nine, so they would be 14 years old. This was in Perth in Western Australia. And I love it because what they did was the teachers showing everything that they're going to have to do by the end of this unit of work. And then you can see progress is built into it. That there's this expectation that they will move from this column here all the way through to this column here. And we will be looking to move ourselves forward. Now, I'm not sure about the smiley faces, and I really don't know what a Mexican bandit is doing on here, but, you know, the point is getting them to move forward. Take a look at those labels. Now, those labels I'm not applying to Carol Dweck, by the way. But if you take a look at those, what she's saying is use those labels, and you see some are good and some are bad, use them to label the actions rather than the children. We say what they're doing, what they're doing well, and what they're not doing well. Her latest research is looking at racism and finding that if I say to somebody, you're a racist person, that person's defenses goes up. But if I say that was a racist thing to say, they're far more likely to say, yes, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, and they move on. And it's exactly the same with any of those labels. If you like, we should be seeing them as adverbs rather than adjectives. We should be using them to describe the actions, the things that children are doing rather than the things that children are. There's a picture to finish off of my son and daughter. You can look, I mean, look at that. That, that my son there, that passes as a smile for him. That's about all he can muster. That's the most positive smile. Now, you can imagine which one of those two gets called naughty more often than the other. Which one is the angel? You can see it. You don't even know them. You can see it. That's not a good thing for me to be saying. I ought to be talking about their behaviors rather than who they are. What they do, what they try, what they have a go at, talking about those things because they can change them. Thank you very much for your time, or should I should say, taximuka. <laughs>